In 1964, a 17-year-old girl was gathering up the courage to confess her deepest, darkest secret. She confided in her vicar that, despite having grown up as a boy, and everyone saying that she was a boy, she felt that she was a woman. The vicar felt it was his duty to help this poor, misguided young man out. He introduced her to a psychiatrist, who agreed to help her get rid of these unwelcome and strange desires. As it was clearly a fetish for women's clothing, driving this unwanted perversion, they all agreed on one course of treatment. That autumn, this person, still a child, was taken to a secluded room in this Northern English hospital and sat down in front of a wall. Electrodes were placed on her arms and about 70 volts was applied across her body as images of women's clothing were projected onto the wall. Unlike electroconvulsive therapy, which induces seizures and can be done under sedation, electrical aversion therapy requires total awareness throughout. The 17-year-old endured five or six sessions of this before stating that she wanted to stop, apparently cured. After a career in teaching and a life of flashbacks and ongoing physical complications, she transitioned anyway. She was far from the only person to live through this treatment. Electrical aversion therapy is no longer legal in the United Kingdom. However, the belief that transsexualism is a diagnosable and curable condition still exists either as an unspoken belief or sometimes outright. Conversion therapy, the harmful and disproven practice of trying to cure a gay or trans person of their unwelcome urges, is now finally facing a ban. However, in April of 2022, the UK government announced that trans people would actually not be included in this ban. Shockingly, at the time of filming, it is still legal to try and cure a trans person. Hi, my name's Cass. I'm a registered nurse and I work in this a and &E. I'm also trans. This is the third film in a series dedicated to increasing the confidence and cultural competence of healthcare professionals looking after trans people in specific areas. If you're not in healthcare, you're by all means welcome to watch and share, but just know that we will be wading into the reeds with some medical jargon. Generally speaking, the NHS does not provide or condone ex-gay or ex-trans conversion therapy. With that said, we should probably get this out of the way. Being trans is not a mental health condition. There are no widely accepted clinical means to end a person's desire to live outside the gender role assigned with the sex that they were given at birth. The only way for most trans people to live a content, open and honest life is to do exactly that. So why is it that by almost any measure in those who have transitioned, we see significantly higher rates of mental health diagnoses and lower life satisfaction? Trans people are at least four times as likely as their cisgender counterparts to be diagnosed with one or more mental health conditions. And at least 40% of young trans people report having seriously contemplated or even attempted suicide. The unfortunate truth, simply put, is that it is hard to grow and thrive as a trans person in this society. We face a higher risk of violence, discrimination, un- or underemployment, internalised resentment or rejection. This naturally leads to the kinds of psychological trauma that scientists increasingly associate with mental ill health. All of this means that a disproportionate number of the people accessing mental health care are going to be trans. So what, you might be thinking, I'm all about person-centred care and I treat everyone the same. Unfortunately, reality paints a different picture. Qualitative data from one study suggested that around a tenth of trans people had been turned away from mental health services simply because they were trans. One fifth of participants had been intentionally dead named, which is using a person's previous name, or mispronounced, referring to them how they don't want to be referred. By far the most common problem, and this is something that I've experienced in my own life, is healthcare professionals expecting their trans patients to educate them on issues from what it means to be trans to very personal questions like surgical techniques and even specific methods of intercourse. One fantastic resource published by UK advocacy group Transactual which we'll link below, details some of these experiences. Recurring themes include misdiagnosis, being turned away, or having agency and decisions completely removed. For unclear reasons that may or may not be causally linked, neurodiverse traits such as autism and ADHD are more common in the trans population. With that said, there are plenty of people with autism and ADHD who are not trans. The link between autism and gender incongruence has occasionally been used to question the capacity of adults and young people alike to consent to gender-affirming treatment. Autistic trans people sometimes report being told flatly by medical professionals that their gender confusion is due to their autism. This is only one component of an unfortunately prevalent 
tendency in medicine to disenfranchise autistic people. It's beyond the scope of this video, but I think as patient advocates and as medical professionals, it's important for us to remember that everyone is entitled to the same assumption of capacity under UK law, and that everyone has the same right to reasonable adjustments to facilitate a proper assessment. Some of these problems are exclusive to the trans population, whilst others are merely specific examples of problems in wider psychiatry. Everything from underfunded and under-resourced service provision to lingering paternalistic attitudes left over from the days of institutionalisation. It's easy to overcomplicate the issue. We, as healthcare professionals, have to find the balance between a holistic approach where we take into account a person's trans identity, whilst not over-pathologising what might be the most concrete truth in a person's life. So, with the help of Jacob from Transparent Training, let's take things back to basics and keep things simple. His five key points to remember when looking after trans people that you can use to influence your practice. Number one, believe us. Trans people know ourselves. We spend a large amount of our lives, probably more than most, thinking about who we are, our place in the world, and how we want to appear to others. Listen to us, trust us, and above all, treat the person in front of you with respect and dignity. We're not coming to you for pity or to teach you something new and exciting. We're coming to you because we have a problem and we're needing your help. Whether or not someone is trans doesn't change how you interact with us or how you answer our questions. And while we're on the subject, it's really important that you believe us. What we say our name is and our pronouns are, Please listen to that, respect it, and use them. Number two, it isn't because we're trans. Whilst trauma inflicted on us by society may be a significant factor in the problem we're asking for help with, consider what, if anything, that actually changes. For example, is your patient self-harming or experiencing disordered eating because they're trans? Or because of the way that their parents, their family, and even you treat them as a result? The difference is nuanced, but crucial. From this, we can see that being trans doesn't automatically make someone a complex patient. If you had the same story from a cis person, would you prescribe the same treatment or make the same referral? If not, why not? If because the person told me they're trans is the only answer, then that should make you question yourself. Number three, don't instinctively deflect to specialist services. Gender clinics have a limited number of things they can refer to and often the support they give is very transition related. This is especially important for children and adolescents, where the waiting lists are so long that a child is unlikely to be seen by the youth service and instead go straight on to the adult waiting lists. It's really important to know that you don't need to fix someone's gender problems before dealing with other things that they're facing. If you're referring someone on because you think someone is better prepared to care for a trans person, consider why you weren't able to provide that care. There's a risk of sending a vulnerable person up yet another treatment dead end. Many specialist services have years-long waiting lists. What are you going to do to provide care in the interim? Number four, don't rely on us to educate you. As trans people, we're used to coming to a healthcare interaction as the more knowledgeable person. This is an unfortunate consequence of training and development that often ignores the trans population. Many healthcare professionals respond quite negatively to being told that they're missing something by an expert patient. But just as often, they'll take it as permission to ask very invasive, irrelevant questions about a person's personal life. This betrays a lack of professional boundaries, but also levels an expectation on us to answer these demeaning and often deeply personal questions in order to continue to access treatment. Sometimes the relationship between you and your patient may facilitate this kind of two-way communication, but that is the exception rather than the rule and only comes after this kind of relationship is built. If you use the first appointment to satisfy your curiosity, then that trust is immediately broken. On the other hand, when you go away and find the answers to these questions, this shows genuine compassion and an actual interest in your patient's lived experience. You can find some great jumping off points in the references to this series. We'll also link to Jaya's, who provide all sorts of practical information and resources, and we've already mentioned Transactual. This isn't a definitive list, but it goes some way to showing just how much information is freely available. Number five, being trans is not a medical condition. If you've had somebody referred to you purely because they are trans, question it. Sometimes you may be the most appropriate service. Certainly in the case of CAMS, this is the primary pathway for young people to be able to access gender clinics. In many cases, however, you may just be contributing to the pathologization of someone's gender identity. It's absolutely fine to find nothing wrong and just be there for reassurance and signposting. But when mental ill health is present, remember that you're there to treat the illness and not someone's gender. Transgender, Transsexualism and gender dysphoria are not valid medical diagnoses and should not be included in someone's past medical history. And they certainly shouldn't be documented or considered under any part of the assessments of the Mental Health or Mental Capacity Act. 
Okay, that was all quite heavy. It's no secret that mental health funding and resource allocation has been slashed over the last few years, and waiting lists, bed occupancy, and staff morale are all at record lows, having suffered at least as badly as any other part of our health service. This affects everyone, but has a particularly stark effect on members of marginalised groups. Trans people are no exception, although the negative perception they have towards mental health services is not the result of coronavirus or austerity, it's the result of an often adversarial relationship between psychiatry and trans people that dates back to the 19th century and earlier. I hope you find this introduction to these issues informative and compelling. Times are changing, but we need to lead by example. Thank you so much for listening.